Hello, literature students. If you're watching this video, we're going to be discussing the short story uh, from Alice Walker called Everyday Use. This is a story that we uh, read as often assigned in my Introduction to Literature, Elements of Literature class. And oftentimes I, I pair this story with other um, uh, contemporary stories from this sort of period of African-American um, uh, history and in our unit, race, class, and gender. Um, and so we're going to look at the story from both the standpoints of how it functions as a work of literature and a work of fiction, but we're also going to discuss in the context of race, class, and gender, this unit that is where we, uh, where we often encounter the story and elements of literature. So one of the things that might be helpful to think about with this story is, is how it contrasts with the Zora Neale Hurston story, Sweat, which was published much earlier and is, is describing a period in the South that's much earlier. Um, but also in Sweat, we're discussing a community that's kind of self-segregated in, in Florida. There are no white characters in that story. I don't believe there are any white characters in everyday use, except maybe the fantasy scene with Johnny Carson. And so as far as race goes, these, these stories are different than what we later encounter in some of our, our literature where we have conflicts and we have much more uh, elaborate explorations of race hatred and racism. Um, in these stories, the race issues are there, but they're a little bit tangential. And in this case, there is some issues about African-American identity that's gonna be brought to the fore, ironically, uh, in this case, in maybe an unexpected way. And there's going to be uh, some elements that deal with gender, uh, perhaps a little bit, and class, class issues. So they all kind of wrap up and there's a nice intersection there. It might be helpful to understand the context of everyday use. If we go back to our, our unit in Elements of Lit and we look at some of the resources I posted on, um, on uh, the Harlem Renaissance. Now, uh, this story was published, I think in 1974. Um, and so this is well after the main import or main impact of the Harlem Renaissance. But let's take a look at some of the key concepts there in that Lesson 10 unit uh, for Elements of Lit this summer 2023. If we're looking at this, I put together a mini lesson, and I oftentimes share this across my literature classes when we're discussing African-American literature. We do want to pay some attention to the Harlem Renaissance. And again, this is a much earlier period that we're looking at, but its influences have uh, redound throughout history and into black culture and certainly have an impact later on a writer like um, Alice Walker. Now with Zora Neale Hurston, she was a part of the Harlem Renaissance. She was there in the thirties and forties in New York and elsewhere, writing, being a part of that. Um, as we saw in Sweat was published, in, the short story Sweat was published in um, Fire, which was a publication of this sort of group of, of, of folks that we've now come to identify with the Harlem Renaissance. And so there's a lot we can learn from the Harlem Renaissance that these uh, traditions might carry on forward into a story like everyday use. And so I hope you did take time or take time to look at these resources that might be posted on the Harlem Renaissance or that you look into it. You start to see what was going on with this assertion of a black arts movement that says, we do not need to define ourselves in relation to white culture. We do not need to define ourselves in relation to this culture. We need our own culture and we need to celebrate the achievements in the arts, which can include you know, the visual arts, the figurative arts, uh, writing, poetry, painting, sculpture, photography, music, of course, movies, plays. These were all very important. And, and there was a, a coalescing of ideas and viewpoints around this. Now they weren't all consistent and they were being debated in the publications of the days. And we have certainly W.B. Du Bois and Langston Hughes and, and uh, other people that are Elaine Locke. Lots of people are coming in and they're, they're putting forth manifestos and ideas about what should be going on in the Harlem Renaissance. There was a lot of discussion and debate about whether to accept, accept white patronage. There were a lot of white customers, a lot of white people who were interested in African-American culture, sometimes for good reasons and sometimes for more of these negative reasons, like kind of a, 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 a flirtation or interest in what they called primitivism at the time. Regardless, it's all gone through in these units that I've presented to you and in this really nice Wikipedia article. There's a really good overview on the Harlem Renaissance. It shows you where Harlem is. It shows you where these various um, 
you know, uh, aspects. So, you know, I point out right here uh, in East Harlem, just above Central Park. This is where uh, a few weeks ago we were in New York. We had an Airbnb in this area when we were visiting New York. So it's really an interesting cultural period. Um, and there's a lot that informs this. But one of the things that then has this later impact is something that has to go with uh, some of the movements and the ideas that were going on um, in literature, religion, discourse, uh, all these sort of other, other elements. Characteristics and themes. Okay, characterizing the Harlem Renaissance was an over-racial pride that came to be represented in the idea of the new Negro. Okay, does that not sound a little bit like what D or Wangaro is saying in everyday use. It really is a new day for us, she says to her family. So there's quite a bit of discussion about black is beautiful. And this is this is later. This comes in these later movements, but its origins are in the Harlem Renaissance and on up into the 70s and beyond, with an emphasis on black is beautiful. Don't believe the cultural stereotypes about black being bad or being inferior. Actually, let's look at black culture going all the way back to the pyramids. We've done some amazing things and here's some of our amazing art. And we can also through these manifestos and these, these movements, we can create a new day for ourselves. Again, this sounds very much like D, a new Negro who through intellectual and production of literature, art and music could challenge the pervading racism and stereotypes to promote progressive and socialist politics and racial and social integration. The creation of art and literature would serve to uplift the late, the race. Um, there would be no uniting from singularly characterizing the art uh, that emerged from the Harlem Renaissance. It was all over the place, many different ideas. It's, a, it's, it's sim overly simplistic to say it was one thing, but what we do know is this idea of black is beautiful and an attention, an understanding, and an interest in African culture, African culture, continental African culture, and the homeland, so to speak, and the origins of Black people in America from this transatlantic slave, going back and tracing these roots and talking about the oppression that led to this. These are all elements that are signaled in the story, including quite a bit that was very popular in the 70s that had to do with Pan-Africanism. And Pan-African in the 70s involved uh, the most probably obvious thing is the Afro, um, but also the dashiki, the traditional tribal costumes. Uh, you know, this is not an area that, uh, that I'm very uh, uh, familiar or versed in, but I know enough about Pan-Africanism to know that there was an interest in adopting these traditional, tri these traditional um, African cultural elements, colors uh, of African tribal motifs, a uh, very bright colored clothes, flowing gowns, a lot of jewelry, hoop earrings, afros, sunglasses, all this sort of stuff that we characterize with the Pan-African movement of the 70s is being explored in this story, Everyday Use. So you might wanna read up a little bit on Pan-Africanism um, and, uh, and some of those ideals. And now let's talk a little bit about what was going on in our uh, forum discussion. So if we go back and share screen here, um, let's take a look at uh, our discussions and um, see where we land on uh, the uh, forum discussion for Walker. These were the questions that I often ask students when we take up this story. Um, we might, first of all, talk about the point of view in comparison to Zora Neale Hurston's earlier story, Sweat, which was in a third person limited omniscient perspective Everyday use is, is definitely in first person. So the protagonist in most, this is a good example of how we might explore the idea of a protagonist. We're often told in first person, the protagonist is the participant narrator, right? But what grandma is able to do, or I'm sorry, what, what, what the mother is able to do is to give us insights on her two daughters and herself and how she fits in this entire situation of moving from a more from from one way of living in the world to another way of living in the world in this transitional period, we have the grandma's perspective. We also have some attention to details such as colorism. Uh, you know, having an African American character who describes herself as very black, and then describes one daughter as having darker facial features or darker skin tone than the other daughter. This is one of those issues that's explored 
in the Harlem Renaissance and in Pan-Africanism and in a lot of these areas that edge towards the question of passing for African-Americans that can pass as white or who have light enough skin that they advance more fully into culture and into society and its own inherent racism or color prejudice that you sometimes see within African-American communities that African-American artists and writers themselves speak about, that certain characters with very dark skin tones are held in a certain view as inferior within black culture, that this is something that can come up or it can be made fun of or it can be, and this is part of what's in the story through the mother's perspective as well. Um, so and, and and so that's part of the way that the the point of view is is uh, is utilized here. Then we want to think about the characters of Maggie and Dee. That was another question. Um, and if we compare and contrast the the characters of Maggie and Dee, we're told oftentimes when we look at this story that there's the country mouse and the city mouse um, parable, right? Um, but the country mouse in this case, Dee, has gone off and she's gone to college. And the rest of the family has really sacrificed. The mother saved money, worked very hard. We're told from her perspective how much she's done because her daughter hated living in this rural South area, in this dirt house, this dirt yard. She didn't like it. She wanted to go to college. And now she's gone to college. She's become educated in a lot of these issues and ideas that we've been talking about. And she's coming back. And most readers find her a highly objectionable and annoying character um, because she's so rude to her family. And the irony here is that part of her Pan-African identity asks her to think about her roots. And so she's going back to her roots by coming back to this place she really would rather forget about. And she wants it to be a certain way a certain way that is kind of historical and in the past. And now we're at this moment where we can wear afros and, and dashikis and, and have this more progressive view. And we can appreciate the past, but the past is the past. Well, of course, the main tension of the story is that Maggie and the mother are still living in these circumstances. And they actually have the authentic identity of African-Americans in the South, uh, unlike the know-it-all daughter who's gone off to college and is trying to tell them what their culture is. So that's the tension, and both of them are true. What, what Dee is encountering in college is true, but what her parents, what her mother and her sister are encountering back on the old place is true as well. Um, and so Dee tends to emerge as kind of a negative character in this regard. Um, when we talk about objects, symbols, and devices, you know, students oftentimes point out the, uh, the butter churn, um, the quilts are obviously a potent symbol. And, uh, and so let's go through a couple of these in the story. And then at the end, we wanna talk a little bit about what the title means. So anyway, we open with the mother and I'm gonna call up uh, an example of uh, the story here as it was published in Harper's in 1973. So again, think what's going on. If you've seen movies through this time, like Black Panther or, um, some of these other uh, films that uh, uh, that have uh, the Chicago Seven that have come out in the last few years, um, you'll see this period depicted. So think about big hair, think about flashy outfits, think about those sort of things. And this rural area where the mother says, I will wait for her in that yard that Maggie and I made so clean and wavy yesterday afternoon. They don't have grass, they have dirt, they rake it really nice. Um, this is a, you know, a, a dirt yard, a dirt house. Maggie will be nervous until after her sister goes. She will stand hopelessly in the corner. So right away, we have Maggie defined as the, the meek and timid sister, the injured sister. She was injured in the fire that we have some suspicion that D, D probably didn't set the fire, but she certainly didn't try hard to put out the fire. She would have been glad to see the whole place burned to the ground. So there's that legacy. D is Everybody's made sacrifices so Dee can go off to college and become educated. And then she comes and looks down her nose at her family. Well, uh, Maggie is left behind and we know she's going to have to marry the local boy who's not really anything special. And so we have this sort of tension coming through through the mother's uh, narrative perspective. Um, and she talks about those TV shows where the child has made it and is confronted by her own mother and father. Uh, what would they do if a parent and child came on the show only to curse out the insult one another? or a TV mother like me, 
who is, uh, sometimes I dream a dream in which D and I are suddenly brought together on a TV program like this. Out of a dark and soft seat limousine, I'm ushered into a bright room and filled with many people. There I meet a smiling, great, sporty man like Johnny Carson who shakes my hand and tells me what a fine girl I have. Then we are on the stage and Dee is embracing me with tears in her eyes. She pins on my dress a large or orchid, even though she has told me once that she thinks orchids are tacky flowers. In real life, I am a large, big boned woman with a rough man working hands. In the winter, I wear flannel nightgowns to bed and overalls during the day. I can kill and clean a hog as merciless as, as a man. My fat keeps me hot in zero weather. I can work outside all day, breaking ice to get water and washing. I can eat pork liver cooked over the open fire minutes after it comes steaming from the hog. One winter, I knocked a bull calf straight in the brains between the eyes with a sledgehammer and had the meat hung up to chill before nightfall. But of course, all this does not show on television. I am the way my daughter would want me to be, a hundred pounds lighter, my skin like an uncooked barley pancake, lighter. Uh, my hair glistens in the hot, bright lights. Johnny Carson has much to do to keep up with my quick and witty tongue. But that is a mistake. I know even before I wake up, who even ever knew a Johnson with a quick tongue? Who can even imagine me looking strange white man in the eye? It seems to me I've talked to them always with one foot raised in flight, with my head fumed in whichever way is the farthest from them. D, though, she would always look anyone in the eye. Hesitation was no part of her nature. So now we're going to find out. D's going to be introduced. Maggie's going to be introduced. We're going to see how these two characters contrast. We have the mother down now. She's not very feminine, right? She's she's, But she's also very assertive. And here the race issue comes in. She can't look white people in the eye. She likes kind of being in a segregated place uh, away from those people. She's got her own culture, her own life going on. and But she knows that it's not the ideal that her daughter would uh, would would like. So her weight, her, her skin tone, all those things. Um, so, so we have um, Maggie, uh, timid, injured, hiding in the background, come out into the yard. Here comes Dee in the car. Dee is lighter than Maggie with a nicer hair and a fuller figure. She's a woman now, though sometimes I forget. How long ago was it that the other house burned? 10, 12 years? Sometimes I can still hear the flames and feel Maggie's arms sticking to me, her hair smoking and her dress falling off her in little black papery flakes. Her eyes seem stretched open, blazed open upon, by the flames reflected in them. And D, I see her standing off under the sweet gum tree she used to dig gum out of, a look of concentration on her face as she watched the last dingy gray board of the house fall in toward the red hot brick chimney. Why don't you do a dance around the ashes? I'd wanted to ask her. She hated that house so much right? Um, so here, uh, she says, I used to think that she hated Maggie too, but that was before we raised the money and they sent her off to church. Um, and D wanted nice things, a yellow organy dress to wear to her graduation, blank pumps. She was determined to stare down any disaster in her efforts. Her eyelids would not flicker. At 16, she had a style of her own and she knew what her style was. She's assertive. I never had an education myself. After second grade, the school is closed down. Don't ask me why. In 1927, colored asked fewer questions than they do now. So it's, it's setting up this issue where we want to be careful with our complaints about D because she's such a, an annoying character here. But she is learning to be in this culture a new way that's unapologetically Black, right? She's not going to apologize for her culture. But ironically, she's coming back and she's turning her back a little bit on her authentic real culture, her real identity, right? Um, so Maggie, uh, she stumbles along good-naturedly. Uh, she knows she is not bright. She, uh, like good looks and money, quickness passes her by. She will marry John Thomas, who has mossy teeth and an earnest face. And then I'll be free to sit here and I guess just sing church songs to myself. Although I never was a good singer, never could carry tune, blah, 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 blah. Um, so this is the situation that's set up and enter D. So here we have the introduction. When she comes, I will meet. But here they are, right? Uh, so Maggie attempts to make a dash for the house. She's frightened to see her sister in her shuffling way, but I stay her with my hand. Come back here. And here we have the introduction to, um, to D and her boyfriend. It is hard to see them clearly through the strong sun, but 
but even the first glimpse of leg out of the car tells me it's deep. Her feet were always neat looking as if God himself had shaped them with a certain style. From the other side of the car comes a short, stocky man. Hair is all over his head, a foot long and hanging from his chin like a kinky mule tail. I hear Maggie suck in her breath, uh, is what it sounds like. Like when you see wriggling into a snake just in front of your foot on the road, uh. D next, a dress down to the ground in this hot weather, a dress so loud it hurts my eyes. There are yellows and oranges enough to throw black the back the light of the sun. I feel my whole face warming from the heat waves it throws out. Earrings, too, golden, hanging down to her shoulders. Bracelets dangling and making noises when she moves her arm up to shake the folds of her dress out of her armpits. The dress is loose and flows, and as she walks closer, I like it. I hear Maggie go, eh, again. It is her sister's hair. It stands straight up like wool on a sheep. It's black as night. And around the edges are two long pigtails that rope about like small lizards disappearing behind her ears. Wasuzo Tino, she says, coming in and that gliding way, the dress makes her move. The short stocky fellow with the hair in his navel is all grinning, and he follows up with Asalam Alaikum, my brother, my mother and sister. He moves to hug Maggie, but she falls back right up against the back of my chair. I feel her trembling there. When I look up, I see the perspiration falling off her trend chin don't get up says d since i'm stout it makes take something of a push you can see me trying to move a second or two before i make it she turns throwing showing white heels through her sandals and goes back to the car out she peeks with the polaroid she stoops down quickly with lines up a picture of, of me sitting there on front of the house with maggie cowering behind me so this sets up the theme of d wangaro first of all did you notice how the mother is open to it she likes the dress she likes the afro she's going to call her wangaro she's not going to call her d right she's open to this idea it's wangaro or d who is so judgmental and sort of being exploitive of her family getting out the polaroid wanting her mom to sit photogenically in front of the old house but herself d not wanting to live in this house or be a part of the actual culture that's the problem here, right? So she wants these pictures. She wants these museum specimens of what it used to be like to be black. But these people are not living in the past. They're living in the present. And this is also her legacy in her history. And she seems, so that's what the story is going to deconstruct, right? Um, so um, meanwhile, Asalam Alaikum, that's not his name, but that's that's the funny tone of what the mother says. So that's that's obviously uh, Islamic greeting, Asalam Alaikum. Um, and so we're supposed to understand through inference here that Maggie or that Dee is wearing a lot of this, this uh, cultural garb that was very popular at the time. The black is beautiful, the Pan-African movement. There's interest in, in Islam. They're going to eat halal. They're not going to eat any pork. Um, there's, uh, you know, and, and so this is all new to, to the mother and to Maggie. Um, but again, they're fairly open to it. Well, I say, D. No, mama, she says, not D. Wangaro Liwanika Kimanjo. What happened to D, I wanted to know. She's dead, Wangaro said. I couldn't bear it any longer being named after the people who oppressed me. You know as well as me, you was named after your aunt DC, I said. DC was my sister. She named D. We called her Big D after D was born. But who was she named after, asked Wangaro. I guess after Grandma D, I said. And who was she named after, asked Wangaro. Her mother, I said. And now Wangaro was getting tired. That's about as far back as I can trace it, I said. Though, in fact, I probably could have carried it back beyond the Civil War through the branches. Well, said Asalam Alaikum, there you are. Uh, I heard Maggie say. There I was not, I said, before DC cropped up in our family. So why should I try to trace it that far back? He just stood there grinning, looking down on me like somebody inspecting a Model A car. Every once in a while, he and Wangaro sent eye signals over my head. How do you pronounce this name, I asked. You don't have to call me by it if you don't want to, said Wangaro. Why shouldn't I, I asked. If that's what you want us to call you, we'll call you. I know it might sound awkward at first, said Wangaro. I'll get used to it, I said. Ream it out again. So you see how open the mother is? And it's going pretty well. Now they have the dinner. And, um, you know, they're talking a little bit about some of these cultural issues. Um, Hakima Barber, um, the uh, 
Islamic sort of background. Um, uh, he says, I accept some of their doctrines, but farming and raising cattle is not my style. Uh, they didn't tell me and I didn't ask whether Wangaro D had really gone and married him. We sat down to eat right away and he didn't eat collards and pork was unclean and said pork was unclean. Wangaro though went through the chitlins and cornbread, the greens and everything else. She talked a blue streak over the sweet potatoes. Everything delighted her. So then we have a series of these events that sort of build up towards this tension where the uh, D is treating her family like they live in a museum. So the first thing she does is she just, and she's also very possessive. And she says, oh, look at this old uh, buttermill, right? I knew there was something I wanted to ask you if I could have. She jumped up from the table and went over to the corner where the churn stood. The milk in it clabbered by now. She looked at the churn. She looked at the churn and looked at it. This churn top is what I need, she said. Didn't Uncle Buddy whittle it out of the tree you used to have? Yes, I said. Uh-huh. She said happily, and I want the dasher too. Uncle Biddy whittle that too, asked the barber. Dee looked up at me. <coughs> Aunt Dee's first hub, husband whittled the dash, said May. So low you could almost couldn't hear her. His name was Henry, but they called him Stash. Now this is important. Two things are going on. Talk about symbolism. The butter churn, everyday use. They're using it to make butter. They don't have a supermarket and all these fancy things. They make their own butter. And here is D. And she wants to take this away. She wants to put it on her shelf as like a memento uh, for a life that she doesn't even respect. She doesn't want to live this life. She wants it to be like a museum piece, right? And so she completely ignores that there's actual clabber in it. There's milk in it that's ready to be, uh, you know, that's the, the rem remnants after the butter is churned. And, and how is it that Maggie, who we're told later in the story, doesn't understand her roots or her history because she hasn't been to college like her sister D, yet she knows all the people. And we heard from the mother. She knows all the people going back beyond the Civil War. They know their history, but it's not the college or the academic or the, you know, the fancy history that, that D or Wangaro has, has, has learned at college. So there's this... Um, there's this sort of tension here. Maggie's brain is like an elephant's, Wangaro said, laughing. I can use the churn top as a centerpiece in the alcove table, she said, sliding a plate over the churn, and I'll think of something artistic to do with the dasher. <coughs> when she finished wrapping the dasher, the handle stuck out. I took it for a moment in my hands. You didn't even have to look close to see where the hands pushing the dasher up and down made butter had left a kind of sink in the wood. In fact, there were a lot of small sinks. You could see where thumbs and fingers had sunk into the wood. It's a beautiful light yellow wood from a tree that grew in the yard where Big D and Stash had lived. Okay. After dinner, D went, Wangaroo went to the trunk of the foot of my bed and started sifting through it. She brought out two quilts and she starts talking about these quilts that she wants. And uh, the mother points out, she tried to give her a quilt when she went off to college, but she didn't want it because she was embarrassed by it. Now she's all into this cultural history, right? Um, and she says, Mama Wangaro said, sweet as a bird, can I have these old quilts? I heard something fall in the kitchen and a minute later, the kitchen door slammed. Well, that's Maggie in the kitchen. She's like, well, I'm about to lose the quilts. I always lose everything to D. Why don't you take one or two of the others? I asked, these old things was just done by me and Big D from some tops your grandma piece before she died. No, said Wangaro, I don't want those. They are stitched around the borders by a machine. That makes them better, I said. That's not the point, said Wangro. These are all pieces of dresses grandma used to wear. She did all this stitching by hand, imagine. She held the quilt securely in her arm, stroking, and that's a beautiful thing. I mean, we can't be too negative, too, um, too critical of, of, of Dee for wanting to, to expand her horizons and everything. And she's got the right idea, to, but she's being very rude to her family members here. And she's also being a bit superficial. She likes the way that these quilts look, but she doesn't want to actually be a part of the culture. And she certainly doesn't want them to be put to everyday use, which is what the quilts, why they have historical value now is because they were these cultural remnants. They were parts of these people's lives that got pieced together in these quilts. They tell a story, but they were also used. There was, you know, not, you didn't have luxury when you lived this close to the earth and this, this impoverished, you had to make use of everything, right? And um, so some of the pieces like these lavender ones come from old clothes her mother handed down to her, I said, moving up to touch the quilts. D. Wangaroo moved back just enough so that I couldn't reach the quilts. They already belonged to her. And here the mother 
could expand some real cultural knowledge to be, but she's got her, she's got materially possessive in this. Imagine, she breathed again, clutching them closely to her bosom. The truth is, I said, I promised to give them quilts to Maggie for when she marries John Thomas. She gasped like a bee had stung her. Maggie can't appreciate these quilts, she said. She'd probably be backward enough to put them to everyday use. I reckon she would, I said. God knows I've been saving them for long enough with nobody using them. I hope she will. I didn't want to bring up how I had offered D. Wangaro a quilt when she went away to college. Then she had told me they were old fashioned, out of style. But they're priceless, she was saying now, furiously, for she has a temper. Maggie would put them on the bed and in five years they'd be rags, less than that. She can always make some more, I said. Maggie knows how to quilt. Bit of a bit of a dig. So here the college educated daughter and sister comes back and she's telling everybody what they need to know about their culture. And yet she doesn't know how to make a quilt. Maggie does know how to make a quilt. So who has the better, who, who has the more uh, authentic culture here, I guess is the question we might want to ask ourselves. Um, D. Wangaro looked at me with hatred. You will just not understand. The point is these quilts, these quilts. Well, I said, stumped, what would you do with them? Hang them, she said, as if that was the only thing you could do with quilts. Maggie by now was standing in the door. I could almost hear the sound of her feet she made as they scraped over each other. Timid little mouse-like figure, right? Used to always getting the second uh, helping, right? Always the leftovers. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride, right? And it's so sweet. It's so heartbreaking. She says, she can have them, mama. Like she said, like somebody never used to winning anything or having anything reserved for her. I can remember Grandma D without the quilts. Oh, it just touches me to even think about it. I can remember Grandma D without the quilts. I hope you picked up that that is such a major element of this story, that the oral traditions, the, the, the family traditions going back beyond the academic study, beyond the manifestos, beyond Pan-Africanism. This, this is, and it's so interesting that Walker's doing this because you could read this as kind of a critique of a narrow view of what African-American or African culture is. And what she's trying to show is even in this context, the, the one daughter is, uh, D is annoying with the way she's lording over her family. And she's not being honest about her own legacy or her own background. And as much as she asserts that she has a true representation of Black or African-American identity, she has only part of it, right? She has the academic part. She doesn't have the homespun part because she never really felt a part of this culture previously. So Walker's doing quite an interesting thing. You know, she's kind of taking the piss out of academics or taking the piss out of people who are theoretically part of a culture, but then aren't actually invested or part of that actual culture. Um, so anyway, it's just heartbreaking. I can remember Aunt Grandma D without these quilts. I looked at her hard. She had filled her bottom lip with choked cherry snuff and gave her face a kind of dopey hangdog look. It was Grandma D and Big D who taught her to quilt herself. Talk about the legacy. Talk about the Black identity being passed on. She stood there with her scarred hands from the fire, uh, hidden in the folds of her skirt. She looked at her sister without with something like fear, but she wasn't mad at her. This was Maggie's portion. This was the way she knew God to work. And so the portion I think we're supposed to understand is, uh, is a reference to, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, prodigal son. That notion of portion occurs in the Bible a lot. And it is usually used to reference uh, the idea of an inheritance, but also that one might want to have their portion of inheritance or the true inheritance to be in heaven itself and not worry about material things here on earth. But it also works well, with, like I said, with the prodigal son, the, the parable of the prodigal son, who uh, he returns home after having squandered his portion uh, of his inheritance and is welcomed by his father and put in robes and they kill the fatted calf and all that sort of stuff. And so I think that that Walker's drawing some parallels here with that, that loaded term portion. Um, and this is the way she knew God to work. And I think about at the end of Sweat, where I made a great deal about uh, reading that story, it's interesting to parallel these two stories because there's a kind of redemption that occurs at the end of Sweat 
uh, when Sykes is killed by his own misdeed, so to speak. Um, and I think here we have a kind of redemption from what we might imagine, at least the mother in this first person narrative imagines herself to be this big boned kind of basic woman who is not very intelligent, didn't go to school. And yet she has this instinctive smarts and understanding about her culture and her people. It's internalized. And she also knows uh, that she's given a great deal to sacrifice for her daughter and that her own other daughter, Maggie, has given a lot to sacrifice to, to help advance D. And in this one moment, she's going to stand for justice here. Um, and uh, and she says, uh, I looked at her hard. Let me see if I can find the passage. Uh, I looked at her hard. She had filled up the bottom lip with choke cherry. Um, that was this was Maggie's portion. This was the way she knew God to work. When I looked at her like that, something hit me on the top of my head and I ran down to the soles of my feet. Just like when I'm in church and the spirit of God touches me and I get happy and shout. I did something I had never done before. Hugged Maggie to me, then dragged her into the room, snatched the quilts out of Miss Wangaro's hands and dumped them into Maggie's lap. Maggie just sat there on her bed with her mouth open. Take one or two of the others, I said to Dee, but she turned without a word and went out to Hakima Barber. Then this to get us to the end, this is the, the uh, coda to the end of the story. This shows the irony here because there's really a sweet moment where the mother intervenes on behalf of the sister and it's saying something about the everyday use of these quilts, ties the sister to her heritage, to her history, to her identity. Now, what does D or Wangaro say and respond in a household where especially her mother has been very welcoming, agreeing that she likes her clothes, she likes her new hairdo, it's not something she's used to, but she can get used to it, she'll use the new name, she's not being obstinate, the daughter is being obstinate. You just don't understand, she said as Maggie and I came out to the car, what don't I understand, I wanted to know. Your heritage, she said. And then she turned to Maggie, kissed her and said, you ought to try and make something of yourself too, Maggie. It's really a new day for us. But from the way you and mama still live, you'd never know it. Well, which is it? She wants to take a Polaroid of her mom in front of the old shack. She wants the old uh, butter churn that's still being used for everyday use. She wants the old quilts to hang on the wall. You know, uh, which is it? Does she valorize this history or does she think that it's just something from the past, right? Um, she put on her sunglasses that hid everything above the tip of her nose and chin. Maggie smiled, maybe at the sunglasses, but a real smile, not scared. After we watched the car dust settle, I asked Maggie to bring me a dip of snuff. And then the two of us sat there just enjoying until it was time to go to the house and go to bed. What I love about this story is just like sweat, it, it could go in so many different directions. Uh, it could go towards a critique or a uh, uh, reaction against uh, racism, it could be a critique of white culture, it could be all, and instead it's showing the complexity that things are not black and white. And within these families, there's divisions about what is truly important about their history. And, and if you come from a history that includes something as terrible as, you know, slavery, how do you grapple with that history? I don't know what that's like. I don't, I don't come from that culture. And for, for those of you who are adjacent to or from that culture, I hope you can share with the rest of us. I hope you can sort of have at some point a way to share with those of us who don't know what it's like to look back through the lens of history and, and have that sort of uh, conflicted nature, uh, what that must be like. And I think this story captures it very well. And there's a kind of ambiguity through this first person narrative, through the mother about on one hand being very, and you have to wonder then if the author felt the same way, being very appreciative and supportive of these movements that are trying to say it's a new day for us, right? But also, how do we reconcile with the past? That's what this story is trying to do on a symbolic level. And my Lord, if you just read the news or look around you today as we get ready for yet another presidential election and another culture war, history and who gets to tell the history and what gets to be included in the history, and especially the parts of the history that we don't exactly like that make us uncomfortable. These are all questions that are being discussed 
very thoroughly in the public right now. And it's important for us to keep, as college students, important for us uh, to keep on top of these issues. And I think this story does a really good job of exploring these, uh, these ideas in, in a more compelling way than just preaching at us might do. And that's why, even though it's a story from the 1970s, it still has this cultural relevance because Walker is such a great writer. She's able to impart a lot of those important themes and, and, and images and issues. So thank you for uh, uh, hanging out for this discussion of everyday use. And I'll talk to you later.